Thank you for tuning into the Seven Investing Podcast. My name is Dan Klein. I'm being joined today by Max Chasco. And when I say joined today, I am really just here to facilitate Max Chasco. Max did the document. This is his topic. We are going to talk about the three frameworks for evaluating gene editing stocks. Before I met Max, uh, not that Max and I didn't kind of know each other, but before I started working with Max, I'm not even sure if I would have known what a gene editing stock was, and I might have spelled it like blue jeans. So I have learned a lot in this area, and that is all because of, uh, of Max and the other people who've covered these areas here on 7 Investing. But Max, why don't you give a little bit of an intro as to why we're talking about this today? Yeah, thanks, Dan. So, you know, uh, obviously, you know, gene editing with CRISPR, right, it's really popped onto the radar. A lot of investors are very excited about it. And pretty much anything and everything CRISPR related now, um, you know, it's done very well in the markets. And maybe you could argue they're a little ahead of themselves. Maybe you could argue that a lot of that excitement is warranted, right? Yeah, I, I can see it both ways. Uh, I think we'll need more clinical data to support all of that, but uh, definitely make that case. Now, you know, investors want to be experts, but I think there is still a minimum level of information that's required in order to really understand, um, even at a basic level, the investment opportunities in front of you. Um, even when there's, you know, six or so CRISPR stocks right now that are publicly traded, they all have a little bit of differences. They all have some nuances. Uh, so they're not equal opportunities and some have more challenges than others. Um, you know, so when it comes to the competitive landscape, I mean, there's a lot of details and nuances that you want to consider when you're weighing these technology platforms. So Dan and I here thought it would be great to provide some simple frameworks for thinking about this space. Um, so I'm also publishing a publicly available article. Uh, so not behind a paywall or anything that's going to accompany this podcast. Um, so you'll be able to see that and, and that can explain some things a little bit better in written word, but this is a high level uh, discussion of some of these frameworks, how to think about these. Um, and if you enjoy that and you're interested, then, then go read the article. There's tables and graphics as well. Not behind a paywall, but you do have to solve a riddle. Oh, did we drop that? I think we dropped the whole riddle <laughs> requirement. So let, let me give a little bit of context here because I, I think this is true in every space. So let me make a statement that I hear all the time. Sports betting is going to be huge as legalization, or you could say marijuana is going to be huge because of legalization. Thereby, these companies in sports betting and marijuana are good investments. That is not true. That when you say you need to have some information, you need to be able to evaluate in what will become a crowded space. Because if there is money to be made, the space will get crowded. You need to be able to look at something and say, okay, that cannabis, that sports betting, that gene editing company, here is what differentiates them. And you do that by creating a framework. Frameworks are very big amongst our friends. I don't think I've heard that word as much as I've heard it in the past two years. A little bit of a, a shout out to our buddy, Brian Feroldi, who probably has said it more times uh, than any person I know. But you have a three framework system. Why don't we start with framework number one, and that's the three emerging approaches. Feel free to provide any context uh, that I didn't deliver there. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so yeah, the first framework is just, just think about the whole space in terms of the approaches that are emerging for gene editing. Now, very important to point out, a lot of investors and even in scientific literature, scientists will see gene editing very broadly. That's kind of the big umbrella. And then all of these approaches fall underneath of that. I actually would uh, prod investors to draw some clear distinctions between gene editing, which is the first generation approach, base editing, which is the second generation approach, and then prime editing, which is the third generation approach. Uh, so and also important to point out, you know, these are the approaches. There's different systems for each of them. So there is CRISPR gene editing, there's CRISPR base editing, there's CRISPR prime editing. But CRISPR is not the only way to do all those things. There's also talon based editing and arcus based editing. Um, so these are the approaches broadly kind of agnostic in terms of the uh, actual technology used to support it and get there. So if we look at the first generation approach, Dan, that's gene editing, right? That's what I would call it. So the advantages are that it's pretty simple to use. It has a simple therapeutic payload in terms of the, the components. Some of the disadvantages, and this is really the big one here, this is one of the bigger questions outstanding for these companies, is that gene editing requires making a double-stranded break in the genome. So maybe we've seen it in biology class or in school, if you weren't sleeping through that. Um, or maybe in uh, science fiction. Yeah, I was going to say, a, a, any movie starring the X-Men, you also get this graphic. Yeah, maybe you're a big fan of Gattaca. I don't know. Um, is that, did you ever see Gattaca, Dan? I did. Oh, yeah. great movie. All right, so we're all familiar with the double helix. So a double straight breaks means you're, you're cutting the genome in half. You're breaking both of the parts of the double helix. 
Um, and the problem with that is uh, when they get stitched back together, there can be a lot of errors, there can be random mutations, there can be chromosomes, so bigger parts of, of the genome can rearrange randomly in un unpredictable ways. So all of those things, uh, random insertion of genetic material, random deletions of genetic material, rearranging chromosomes, those are all some of the most traumatic events in biology. All three of those are actually hallmarks of cancer cells. So if we're triggering this with the therapeutic payload and an attempt to cure or treat some of these diseases, uh, well, it would be a pretty nasty unintended side effect and consequence, right? So some of the examples of the first generation gene editing companies, I think investors know these pretty well, but this is like CRISPR Therapeutics, Editas Medicine, Intellia Therapeutics, a company that just recently was public, Caribou Biosciences, a little more creative on the names as we get along here, Dan. Um, so those no, are the CRISPR not, to, not to be confused with Caribou Coffee, totally different company. <laughs> So those are all the CRISPR companies uh, that are working on the first generation gene editing approach. So, Max, let me ask a, a very layman question here. Yeah. So in a lot of areas, when you have a first generation, a second generation, a third generation, that means the third generation has supplanted the previous two generations. That, not, that doesn't sound like that's what happened here, that these are different approaches, but first generation might still have benefits or be useful. Am I getting that in any way correct? Yeah, so there, there could be, um, each of these could have value in different applications, and we might just see them sort themselves out over time, where first generation, even though it's called first generation, uh, maybe it's still very useful in a very specific application, or a very specific type of cell, or making edits in a certain organ, for instance, uh, maybe second generation has different applications, third generation, and they all do have quite different capabilities, so you can't necessarily uh, swap each one for another. Um, so just to round out the other companies in the first gen, Selectus, which is using Talons, and then you have Precision Biosciences, which is using Arcus. So CRISPR, Talons, Arcus, kind of the three enzymatic systems. If we move on to the second generation base editing, this one's been very exciting for a lot of investors. So the advantages here is that it doesn't make a double-stranded break in the genome. So it's considered to be much safer. Base editing can also precisely correct genetic defects, and it can also target DNA or RNA. So it's not limited to one information molecule over the other. Some of the disadvantages of base editing is that you can only edit in certain parts of genes. So a gene sequence has different uh, parts to it. Uh, some to get the gene read by the machinery in the cell. Some of the sequence, which really uh, you know, includes the, uh, the protein that we're trying to create in the end. Uh, and then at the end, we have like a sequence that tells the genetic machinery to stop reading that. So we stop making the protein. So base editing can only actually edit in certain parts of the gene. So that does limit some of the diseases we can target. It can also only correct um, certain parts, uh, uh, I'm sorry, certain types of mutations. So relatively simple mutations that does limit the types of diseases as well. Another disadvantage compared to the first generation approach is that base setting has a larger therapeutic payload. So just think of this as being like a bulkier payload, right? If gene editing is a tennis ball, maybe gene editing, or I'm sorry, if, if gene editing is a tennis ball, and maybe base editing is more like you know a soccer ball, so it's a little bit bigger, and that does complicate things in terms of how do we get that into cells? What types of cells can we get it into? Um, I think it will be easy to get it into like the liver, for example, but maybe getting into the muscle or parts of the brain might be much more challenging. So some of the examples here, right, obviously, have Beam Therapeutics. That's one of the, the uh, hottest companies here in this space overall. Uh, Verve Therapeutics, one of the newer CRISPR companies, also using base editing. It's actually licensed a lot of its technology from Beam Therapeutics, and Beam Therapeutics has the right of first refusal, can opt in to co-develop a lot of the programs being uh, developed at Verve. Intellia Therapeutics actually is also working on base setting tools. It only has demonstrated data for ex vivo settings. We'll actually talk about that a little bit later, um, but it is working on that. And I actually think just due to the double-stranded breaks and the risks there, I think a lot of the first-generation companies will eventually have to develop their own base editing technologies. Selectus with Talons also has Talon base editing and Precision Biosciences is working on Arcus based editor as well. So again, uh, not only CRISPR, uh, it extends to a lot of different technologies. There's actually other companies, some I can't talk about for various reasons, but uh, other ways to do base editing. And if we look at the third yeah, generation, Right. Let, let, let so you jump in. in. I, I wanted yeah, to. It's, it's worth yeah. noting that these companies aren't all pursuing one approach. That Selectus you mentioned in both the first generation and the second generation. So it's these companies can adapt and say, okay, this approach might work for this thing, and then this approach might work for something else. 
that is probably better for investors. It also can be a little bit confusing. So I just wanted to do a tiny reset uh, for the people who are coming to this with perhaps less of a background that if you buy some companies, you might be getting exposure to different angles, which gives you more chances for failure and more chances for success. But let's talk about the third generation, which is prime editing, which I was so hoping was the ability to turn into a truck, but it is not, sadly. Unfortunately not. So prime editing, it's the newer, it's the third generation approach. And right now, this can actually only be done with a CRISPR system. There's only one company working on it. It's called Prime Medicine. This was actually spun out of the Lou Lab. Uh, so the Lou Lab also made beam therapeutics and base editing because it said, hey, you know what? There's some limitations to gene editing, making double stranded breaks. I bet we could avoid that and maybe make a more precise way to edit genes. So they came up with base editing. The Lou Lab then said, you know what? Maybe we can do even better than base editing. Maybe we can have even more versatility. So they came up with prime editing. So again, the advantages are this also does not make double stranded breaks. So that's great. It could do everything base editing can do and a little bit more, including knocking in large pieces of DNA to the genome. So if you remember those Gatorade commercials from back in the day, anything you can do, I can do better. I think that's prime editing's uh, tagline, Dan. Um, some of the disadvantages though for prime editing, one, it's unproven, still being optimized. You could say that about all of these uh, systems and technologies. They're all still pretty much for the most part being optimized, but uh, prime editing is the, the least amount of data supporting it. They do have a ton of money though at Prime Medicine, a lot of excitement there from venture capitalists. Yeah, the other disadvantage, and this is very important, is actually the largest therapeutic payload out of all three of these. So base editing is larger than gene editing. Prime editing is even larger than base editing and by a pretty wide margin. And the reason for that is it actually contains two different enzymes. So we don't get into all the details, but an enzyme is a pretty big bulky molecule in and of itself. So we're adding two enzymes instead of one uh, so this might have even more problems trying to encapsulate into a lipid nanoparticle or a viral vector. It probably wouldn't fit in a lot of viral vectors, uh, but it's just thinking about like, how do you get this into a cell? That's going to be a big challenge um, as they try to target, you know, liver versus muscle versus maybe things in the central nervous system like the brain. Shoehorn is not the answer. Max, I think it's fair to say that each of these three are going to be useful in different disease cases, some more specific, some broader. Well, why don't you give a little analysis there? Yeah, that's true. So, um, you know, a good example too, I mean, even when we get really good results, sometimes that's not necessarily like the ideal approach. We're the best example. It's the only in vivo data we have for CRISPR gene editing in any gene editing approach. We just had it in the late June from Intellia Therapeutics. So they had an in vivo CRISPR gene editing knockout um, we'll talk about knockouts in the next framework. And this was targeted to the liver. So it had, they're trying to uh, stop the expression of the TTR gene um, in patients that have uh, a disease called HATTR. So this is caused by mutations in the TTR gene, which causes that TTR protein to misfold. And then it kind of gets clumped together and aggregates and can form these sticky deposits in the liver, also in the heart. Uh, so it, it can be fatal. It's actually thought to be one of the the leading causes of heart disease, maybe just a little um, uh, underdiagnosed in the general population. Um, uh, well, there's different flavors of the disease, I guess you would say. Uh, but so they're trying to knock out the TTR gene. If you don't have the TTR gene, then you can't make the mutated TTR protein. Problem solved. And they got some really good results. One of the biggest issues with this, and this is going to be true as we start to think about, you know, curing or treating genetic diseases, is uh, all genes actually play multiple roles in the body. This is actually a Beautiful example of that because the TTR gene, yes, when it misfolds, it causes some of these diseases and, and, and uh, scarring to build up in certain organs. However, humans also need the TTR gene to transport vitamin A throughout their body. It's only produced in the liver, uh, the TTR gene that is. So if we're knocking it out in the liver, there's no other organ that's going to start expressing the TTR gene to rescue the expression. So vitamin A is needed for vision, Dan. You know all about that. You've had a fun experience with vision in the last year or so. <laughs> but if, if you knock out or silence the TTR gene, um, those patients might not have symptoms of the disease. And it can be fatal, so this could be a good trade-off. But they do require daily supplementation of vitamin A. They can also suffer from, uh, it's called night blindness. So um, in low levels of light, um, they're basically blind. So that may, you know can affect their quality of life, maybe they can't drive a car or do certain things like that. Um, so there are other, you know, side effects and consequences, even though we say the, oh, gene editing, we cured it, this is fixed. Um, there's still room for improvement. So 
Uh, point being, you know, maybe the, the ideal uh, treatment for you know, diseases like this, you know, HATTR, wouldn't be to silence that gene, but maybe to correct the mutation and preserve the levels of TTR in patients so that we wouldn't have to give them, you know, vitamin A or tell them not to drive cars at night and so forth. So I want to move on to framework two, but before we do that, where are we in this game? So we're in the very early stages. You talk a lot about de-risking events, but we know the potential here. How close are we to, you know, significant amounts of meaningful treatments that we expect to work on, on lots of people? Are we talking years? Are we talking decades? Are we talking like, you know, your kids might be dealing with it, uh, you know, and, and mine, mine who's 17 might not be there. Like, what, what's the timetable here? Definitely this decade. Um, I mean, there's some other approaches like from CRISPR therapeutics for uh, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, so two rare blood disorders. Um, a little more complicated process, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next two frameworks as well. Um, but that should be, I mean, I would think it could be approved in the next few years um, until your therapeutics with that knockout of the HATTR gene. That could be approved. There are actually other very effective and convenient treatments for that disease, so that could complicate uh, the commercial picture. And that's important, too, to actually, yeah, this is a great question, because we talk about these things being rare diseases, but there's actually other genetic medicine tools out there. So sometimes the diseases being targeted by these gene editing companies or any of these approaches actually have you know, safe, effective, and convenient treatments um, available on the market. I mean, there's Alnylam Therapeutics has an RNAi, it's called RNA interference drug. Uh, it's probably going to be approved uh, sometime in early 2022 to treat HATTR. And it only needs a dose of, it's a, a simple shot once every three months. They might be able to dose it once every six months, and they're actually working on a, a next generation tool that maybe they can only dose it once every 12 months, get um, you know very high levels of knockdown of that gene, and it would be reversible. So unlike you know gene editing was permanent, so if anything goes wrong, uh, there's no undo button. Uh, there is that for RNAi. So there's different things to evaluate in the competitive landscape as well. It's not as simple as one of these gets approved from a gene editing pipeline. And it's just going to have, you know, billions and billions of dollars in revenue. Some of these could end up being duds because maybe there's safety concerns or doctors are hesitant to um, prescribe these. Uh, maybe other tools are just effective enough and that's all we need. Uh, so, uh, but yes, we should have some of these tools should be approved. Certainly this decade, uh, we should end the decade with, um, man, I don't know, maybe half a dozen or more. Uh, I think gene editing approaches uh, approved. I only brought that up because I think it's important to remember as investors, and I own a lot of these companies. Uh, Max owns a lot of these companies. Uh, I don't own it because of my own volition. I own it because of Max and, and other members of the seven investing team who have uh, the knowledge to, to understand this and where we should go, but recognize that there is some risk here. Some of these things may not work. Some of these things may work and they may end up being way more expensive than solutions that maybe don't work as well, uh, but, but work enough. I think we've seen that in the medical space where it's like, yeah, this $30,000 treatment will cure everything. Uh, even with vision, I had laser surgery. Uh, laser surgery cost about $4,000. If I had the lenses put in that can be adjusted and forever correct my vision, that would have been about $12,000. So did I get the inferior one? Absolutely. Max, feel free to jump in before we get to, uh, to framework two, but framework two is the major applications. Uh, so if you, if you have a past comment, go ahead, or if you wanna just keep plowing ahead, go forward here. Yeah, so you brought up that point of, you know, just the risk and understanding that. And I think that's good too. And you made a comment previously about, um, um, you know, different companies are working on multiple approaches, just in case, right? It's always good to kind of have different tools in the toolbox and spread risk around. So, um, so I do think, you know, some of those first generation companies are going to have to pivot or transition to base editing uh, down the line. Some have already made investments and are developing those tools today. Um, and, and that's okay, but, um, you know, so this is kind of similar, again, we brought up all nylon pharmaceutical group, RNAi. So it, it launched with a ton of hype, RNAi won the Nobel Prize, lots of parallels to how CRISPR kind of started. Um, and then its initial approach just didn't work. It couldn't actually deliver the payloads deliver safely and effectively. I uh, actually had some patient deaths in some of its earlier work. So I'd have to go back to the drawing board and eventually it developed a new tool to really safely deliver uh, its payloads to the liver. Um, and now those drugs are just taking off and it has four approvals. It should end the year with five. Next year it should be six or seven. I mean, 
uh, is firing on all cylinders. Actually, it's the largest genetic medicine company in the world right now. Um, but it wasn't always easy. If you were an investor early on, and uh, there were some times there where maybe you were down 60 or 70 percent, um, but the company did eventually figure it out and pivot. So I think that might be a good analogy for some of these first generation CRISPR companies. A, we're in a crazy bull market, in my opinion. Uh, B, there's a, some of these valuations, historically speaking, are definitely very frothy for drug developers, usually to wait for more data. So there's a lot of success already priced in. If any worrisome safety signal comes in, like some of these are going to have really uh, sharp decreases in their valuation because there's more to give up. But also know that you know, there are ways for them to correct. It just might not be fun in the interim, right? As they're pivoting to base editing, you know, it's all new clinical trials, all new tools. Um, so that could take a little bit longer in order to realize your full potential, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean any of these are dead in the water just because they're using the first gen tools. These are not stocks to buy and then worry about what they're doing every day. These are stocks to take the long view on. And there's even the companies that ultimately win may have setbacks, may have drugs that come to market that don't catch on, uh, may have things that work, but have terrible side effects. We, we've discussed all of it. So let's move on here to framework to the major applications. Uh, it sounds like we're doing a movie sequel here, but uh, why don't you jump in there, Max? <laughs> we gotta get one of those, uh, what do you, What's the thing where they snap it and that's how the new uh, the new scene starts? I don't know anything <laughs> about movies, but anyway, all right. Um, so the major applications, there's a lot of ways to edit the genes, uh, edit genes, and uh, they be, they vary based on the approach. So uh, this section, in this framework in particular, works a lot better out in writing. And this is, I have a great table showing the advantages of each, the disadvantages of each, and the companies that are using each of these applications. But We'll start real quick with knockouts. So we talked about Intelli Therapeutics as a knockout pipeline for its first generation gene editing approach. This is just disabling gene function. So the advantage is it's permanent gene silencing. So some might argue that's an advantage over temporary tools such as RNAi or antisense oligonucleotides. But the disadvantage is also that it's a permanent gene silencing. You could argue that that's not the way to go because if something goes wrong, uh, these patients have no undo button. You can't undo gene editing necessarily. So some of these examples, all of the generation approaches can actually use knockouts. Um, the first generation approach is relatively sloppy. So, you know, not to, I'm not picking on any one company, but Intel is the only one that has data. So, um, you know, with the first generation approach, the way that it knocks out a gene is it actually inserts mutations into that gene. So it's kind of interesting because we usually talk about CRISPR being precise, right? Yeah, and we've heard this in headlines and articles and you and I both kind of know how the media works, but the reality is it's, it's, we have to be careful, right? It's precise because we can precisely target a specific gene, but then what happens after that, how we actually induce the knockout uh, is not so precise necessarily. So these first gen approaches actually insert random genetic material or delete random material. They disable a very important part of the sequence, meaning that gene can no longer be read. Um, now the problem is it can have on target and off target effects. Um, and where we have, you know, each patient might have a slightly different insertion or deletion mutation. Uh, so there are some risks for that. Um, the second generation up approach of so base setting prime editing can also do knockouts much more precise because they can just snip one little base pair. So one little letter in the gene and actually disable genes permanently that way. So that seems like a, the uh, preferred approach, I guess, if you're going to do knockouts at all. The next application will be insertions. So we're just, what it says, inserting more genetic material into a cell. Um, the advantage is precise integration is possible. So this is actually better than gene therapy. Today we have gene therapy. Um, we encapsulate the gene in a viral vector. Um, we deliver it to patients. And it actually doesn't insert the gene into the patient's genome. It creates this other little like bubble. It's called an endosome outside of the nucleus. Uh, but it provides enough of gene expression um, over time. So that's good. But if we used CRISPR to create a very precise um, you know, integration site in a patient's genome, and we could actually insert the gene exactly where it needs to be on the genome. So gene, uh, the genome is kind of like real estate, Dan, where you know location matters. And that was one of the things in the early days of gene editing, uh, 20 years ago, that really held the field back. They actually used to try to insert genes into the human genome, but they would do it randomly. They had no control over where it went. And that could be bad, because if you integrated next to a, uh, the wrong genes, it could actually cause cancer in patients. So having that randomness was just too much of a risk. So uh, now we don't use those viral vectors, we use different kinds. Um, we found a kind of a workaround 
Um, but we can't uh, ideally getting it into the genome where it's supposed to be is ideal for inserting uh, genetic material. And uh, some of these approaches can actually do that. The disadvantage is that uh, insertion actually still requires a viral vector to deliver the genetic material. We're still making double-stranded breaks. We talked about that. I think it's going to be one of the bigger risks for the field. Um, and also, when we're making a double-stranded break and we're working with viral vectors, uh, the viral vector, so that's the thing that we use to encapsulate the genetic material, that in itself, the delivery vehicle, can actually integrate into your genome. Uh, and there's been some issues with that as well in the past. So um, you might be part virus, Dan, if, uh, if, if you had some of these tools worked on you. So like in a cool way, like venom, or in like a not cool way, like I'm sneezing all the time? <laughs> Probably not like venom. Well, uh, that'd be cool though, right? Um, so actually like, and, and this too, double stranded breaks happen all the time, right? Whether we're using CRISPR tools or, or any therapeutic that's gene editing, or you know, uh, you're just sitting in the sun too long. We're, we're going through double-stranded breaks all the time. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a, a deal breaker, but I, I think it's gonna be an important safety risk for the field. And same thing, we actually do have virus integrated into our genome now. Um, so uh, you know, again, is this a deal breaker? We actually don't know the answers to a lot of these questions. Um, another application is activation. So we can actually activate genes. I mean, we're just kind of upregulating their expression. So this can be good for treating diseases where, um, for whatever reason, uh, the genes just not being uh, produced in the right amounts, so maybe you have a disease from uh, inadequate protein expression. Um, for example, we have haploinsufficiency, they're a common uh, class of diseases where, where this is a problem. Um, now, it might be kind of difficult to control how much of the gene we activate. So we don't just want to turn it on and have a full blast necessarily. Um, we might want to uh, only have a little bit or a moderate amount, and that may be a little bit more difficult to control, so that's kind of one of the disadvantages. Uh, again, all the advantages is it's permanent, so that's good, um, and it's potentially better than mRNA tools. So that's another genetic medicine tool. Um, again, that would be temporary, um, so maybe that has an advantage, but we'd have to keep giving doses of mRNA. Maybe in some instances, or it's diseases, you could argue it is just better to have the activation. Uh, the next application here would be precise correction. And this is exactly what it sounds like. So this is kind of where base editing and prime editing come into play. The advantage is it preserves protein levels. So this is different from gene silencing, where we're just saying, we don't need that gene anymore, get rid of it. Because uh, you do need all genes, well, I should say, uh, all genes have multiple roles in the body. So it's not always so simple as saying, we're just going to get rid of that gene or that protein, because um, that can cause other side effects in patients. The disadvantage though, as I kind of mentioned earlier with the second gen approach is um, there are a limited number of genetic mutations you can actually precisely correct. Um, so if there's like really large mutations spanning larger sequences, might be a little bit out of reach of base editing tools right now or for the foreseeable future. The final application, at least the last one I wrote down is knock-in. Uh, so this is kind of like insertion that we talked about, but um, it's a little bit more precise, and so that's an advantage. The disadvantage would be it's a little more complicated mechanism, and it can be difficult to precisely control, uh, so similar to the activation. So um, I think the only thing that can really do knock-ins, or I think the best bet we're going to have is going to be actually prime editing. So I think prime is the only uh, approach that can actually use knock -ins. So if you're missing like a big chunk of, your, of some gene, Dan, we can actually maybe knock it in instead of knocking it out. That works for me. Uh, we're gonna move into framework three. So Max, let me ask one quick question here and don't take a lot of time answering this, but what are the risks here? Are, are, is the testing procedure robust enough to make sure that you don't you know, uh, cure my arthritis, but stop my body's ability to process oxygen? You know, or like, like I'm, just, I'm being a little bit ridiculous here, but playing with genes obviously has some risk here. Uh, so are we sort of insulated from this and in how the levels of testing works to get these to market? This is a great question, Dan. I'm proud of you. So um, <laughs> this, this isn't even on the sheet. This is a great question. Hey, um, years of watching The Incredible Hulk has, has taught me some things in this area. So this is a great question. Right now, uh, drug developers are self-regulated. So it's up to them to kind of sequence patients, uh, or even if those patients are maybe mice or non-human primates, to get an idea of what other effects their tools might be having. There is some debate on whether or not they're doing the proper amount of uh, developing the right diagnostics to survey enough of the genome in order to uh, tell if their, their tools are having effects they shouldn't be. 
Um, so for example, in order to see all of the possible off-target and on-target effects, you'd probably need to do some really robust whole genome sequencing. Not every company is doing that. Sometimes they're only looking at sequences that might be very similar to what they're editing, just so they can say, well, we looked at the seven most common things and it, we didn't see any effects, so we're, we must not be having any off-target effects. And maybe it's not so simple because uh, your genome is really large, really complicated. And when you're making double stranded breaks, um, you can have large deleterious effects or really bad consequences, even when you're making your edit exactly where you intend to. So I think the FDA, this is one of the risks, I guess, of safety and regulatory. And you know, all it takes is one company to really screw up a trial and the whole field could be put on a clinical hold. Um, so that is a huge risk for the field. Then the FDA might come in and say, all right, we need to develop better diagnostics to understand this in clinical development. Um, and also monitoring patients who've been treated with these because, you know, years from now, if problems arise, but you've already treated hundreds of people, well, might, that might be too late or the wrong time to really figure out that you screwed up. Um, so this is a, a, a bigger risk because it's a permanent uh, tool, unlike other drugs that have been developed to date. As we move on to framework three, I'll, I'll make a little bit of an aside joke here. We always sort of see the Spider-Man example where like you get bitten by a radioactive spider and you get all the advantageous traits of being a spider. You don't see the opposite where you get bitten by a radioactive spider and you get all the non, you don't get the brain of a spider, like you get the strength. Like, and that is in a very ridiculous way, the risk here that sometimes in curing something, the unintended consequence, what you mentioned with vision before, well, that might be worth it in the case of certain things uh, where, okay, I can't drive at night, but like my liver keeps working like that. That's good. Um, on the other hand, perhaps you are curing something that's, you know, more an annoyance than something that's life-threatening where the side effect could be worse. So again, the only reason we bring all this up is this is a long road, but let's get to framework number three, the major administration routes. Uh, administration doesn't mean what I would normally think administration means here. Yeah, no red tape here for administration. So this <laughs> is how do we actually get the drug into the patient? Uh, so we have in the body is in vivo. So the, the, the way we're editing genes, that tool is actually the drug itself. Then there's outside the body. So that's ex vivo. So we're taking cells from a patient, we're extracting them, we're editing them in the lab and then we are re-ejecting them back into the patient. And then we have Ricky Martin, who is living the Vita Loca, Dan, uh, the <laughs> other type of mouse. <laughs> yeah. So the advantages for in vivo are, of course, it's simpler for patients, right? You show up to your, uh, maybe it's an infusion center, your doctor's office. Uh, right now, there's nothing of uh, subcutaneous delivery for, for any of these approaches, but um, much simpler for patients. If you show up, maybe you, uh, uh, you know, maybe you have a, a slight immune suppression drug that you're given ahead of time or something, maybe not. And maybe it just, we've designed the drug so well and so precisely, they get exactly where they need to in the body. The disadvantage is it's more difficult to control. Once we administer this, we give you an IV infusion. Well, it's up to that engineering in order to get it to the liver or to the muscle tissue or to the brain. Um, and actually we can't deliver to the brain. These cannot cross the blood brain barrier uh, and again, it has to do with our size. They're encapsulated lipid nanoparticles uh, or viral vectors. So um, we can't actually give you an IV infusion to get to the brain. We'd have to do what they call, quote, minimal invasive uh, brain surgery. Dan, I don't know. If, it sounds like an oxymoron to me. I don't know if there's minimally invasive brain surgery, but- um, Like brain surgery, and then you're back to work in an hour? Like th this doesn't, it doesn't seem like those two things would go together. Yeah, well, they're looking at like, you know, how are we going to treat neurodegenerative diseases with some of these tools, right? So we can't do an IV infusion, but- you know, there's different routes. There's intrathecal, so we can inject it into your spinal cord. Um, and then there's uh, 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 directly into your brain. What, what is that called? Uh, I forget. There's too many words. There's all these, uh, there's so many different administration routes. But anyway, it's still an in vivo approach is my point. So, um, but the disadvantage is more difficult to control. Once it's in the body, you know, it's going to do what it's going to do. And uh, if you didn't design it properly, that could be a risk. For X, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, ne never, never mind. I was going to get to the questions here, but you have a little bit more to do. So sorry for stepping on you oh, there. That's all right. Uh, so for ex vivo, the advantages are you have way more control over the process, right? We're taking cells from a patient and then we're uh, editing them in a laboratory setting. So that has a lot of advantages. You can see, did we actually do this correctly? So we have multiple shots in order to make sure it's 100% correct or as high accuracy as you can get. You can also screen some of the cells before you put them back in the patients. Uh, so maybe you can 
weed out the things that weren't edited correctly or maybe don't look, you know, look a little funny, uh, however you're, you're determining that. Uh, so that is an advantage, right? We have more control over the process. The disadvantages are that ex vivo is actually more complex. There's more process steps involved. I mean, with the harvest cells from a patient, and oftentimes that requires, you know, uh, uh, immune suppression somewhere in here. Um, it's more expensive because there's more steps. And the more steps you have, the more chances there are for errors to come up and arise, right? Um, so we've seen this, for example, with some of the first generation CAR T cell therapies and cancers. Um, we need to harvest those from patients. It's, you know, it takes many weeks to, to do the whole thing from, it's called vein to vein time. So from the time we harvest it, from the time we put it back into the patient, um, you know, three, four weeks or longer, long time to wait if you're trying to get treated for something like cancer, an aggressive form of cancer. Um, so that is one of the downsides. So Max, let me jump in. First of all, Matt Cochran wants me to ask you to stop signing him up for off-label human trials for these. He is not going to go for it. No, I'm kidding a little bit. Second, is one of these better than the, of the other? Like, you know, you have on the sheet here, is, is in vivo always better? But it, it seems to me like there's going to be uses for both of them, right? Yeah, so some companies are only working on in vivo approach. I'm sorry, some companies are actually only working on ex vivo. So Caribou Bioscience is one of the newer companies that went public. Uh, they have a proprietary CRISPR system, and they're only working on making cell therapy. So that's only an ex vivo approach. There's other companies that kind of dual pipelines, right? So if you look at uh, CRISPR Therapeutics, Editas Medicine, and Intelli Therapeutics, those all have uh, both in vivo and ex vivo approach. Um, so ex vivo does make sense for if you're engineering cell therapies. So there are all these companies are actually engineering CAR T uh, cells to make cell therapies that way for cancer. So that makes a lot of sense to use ex vivo there. But then there's a gray area when it comes to, you know, uh, rare diseases. Currently, I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, CRISPR Therapeutics is working on an ex vivo first generation gene editor for beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. So again, that requires harvesting cells from patients, editing them in the lab, putting them back into the patient. It has impressive results, um, but again, it, it leaves a little bit to be desired. Maybe it's not the ideal approach. Could we design an in vivo gene editor to do the same thing? So maybe it, instead of taking four weeks, it takes you know a single office visit or infusion. Uh, obviously that would be more ideal for patients. Uh, so that's kind of the promise of in vivo, but uh, it, it kind of depends on the cell types, uh, the types of edits and applications you're trying to go for. Um, and also what diseases you're trying to treat. I think ideally, like the holy grail would be we could edit any cell in the body, wherever it is. Um, so there's a company actually working on that called Santa Biotechnology. Um, not necessarily a gene editing company, but uh, yeah, that's their crazy aspiration. And they succeed, they're gonna be a very large company, but lots of challenges there. And um, you know, they have to develop a lot of technology. But so sometimes ex vivo is perfect and that's all we need. Sometimes in vivo really is better. Max, before we recap, you know I'm a sci-fi fan, and uh, in some of the Robert Heinlein books, they've sort of engineered humanity to not live forever, but live on a very extended basis. How long is it before I go to the mall and there's a, I mean, we have places at the mall now that are doing various, like, you know, uh, improve your skin, improve, you know, lose weight, whatever it is. How long before I go to the mall, take some tests, they're like, hey, you have these six things wrong with you, and here are these treatments we could give you, and you know, you're now going to live 15 more years. Is this actually going to like sort of unlock some of the secrets of, uh, you know, of living forever for humanity? And I'm teasing a little bit, but I'm also being really serious because if you could eliminate, say, you know, the types of heart disease that kill the most people, well, obviously that's going to have a meaningful impact, uh, especially if that becomes something you could do, you know, on your lunch break, as opposed to having a big major doctor's appointment to do it. Yeah, that's a good question. There are, uh, so in terms of like anti-aging, there's a lot of science we need to figure out for that. But you're right, in terms of improving not just your lifespan, but your health span. Imagine you were very healthy into your 70s. Well, that could change a lot. I think that reduces healthcare costs for you, your family, the entire healthcare system. That would be a very good uh, goal to strive for. And we do kind of start to see some of these tools maybe have that potential. Right now, in the early goings, the early days of the field, most of these platforms are, are targeting rare diseases, diseases that have no other treatments. Um, so very small, like relatively small patient populations, maybe thousands of, of patients worldwide that are affected, maybe tens of thousands. And really at the higher end, maybe a maybe hundred thousand or something around there. Um, so it's still relatively small patient populations. Of course, if you're selling a drug for 
you know, two million dollars a year, it, it kind of adds up. Now, there is uh, the possibility we could start to use these to, you know, rather than like correct mutations, we could actually give humans beneficial mutations that would protect them from disease. Um, so there's there's a lot of examples. There's examples of like for we can give you a variant of a gene, and these are actually found. Uh, throughout the world and, and normal like people walking around people just have genetic variants um, very rare sometimes but uh, you know they give them maybe a much higher like eight times higher bone density so they won't break bones as easily and they also won't um, have osteoporosis right they have a much lower risk of that they are also worse swimmers when you have denser bones so uh, there's still but, but better UFC fighters so it could really go in either exactly. direction exactly better wear your shin splints so um yeah, or shin guards, you would get shin splints. So yeah, there's that. And then there's also, uh, so we talked about this one company a little bit, uh, Verb Therapeutics, it's the newer CRISPR base editing company. And they're working on providing uh, uh, protective uh, variants for um, protecting against cardiometabolic diseases. So right now they're targeting uh, people with like, you know, very rare types of high cholesterol, meaning like you've inherited um, just you know, you got a bad roll of the dice and for whatever reason, your body doesn't process cholesterol and it builds up in your blood. So that's their initial target. But they've stated like, well, we could give this, there's no reason we can't give this to Dan and Max and, and Matt Cochran as well. Um, so they could eventually have this instead of taking a pill every day, like a Lipitor to lower your blood cholesterol. Maybe one day we just go and get edited with this protective variant and none of us really develops. Uh, we all have like a very easy time keeping our levels of blood cholesterol low. So that's a pretty interesting uh, uh, goal and target. And that's something that is absolutely on the table with some of these technologies. I am making every effort to do all the right things now so I can live to the point where these things are at the mall or are easy to come by from your doctor. I feel like I'm a little bit on the old age side of, you know, you better stay healthy for like another decade or so. So all of this stuff is there. So, well, so that, that company, Verve, um, you know, they have, they're the only company that has base editing that in non-human primates. So that's kind of like the last animal model we use before we try in, in human testing. And um, in those non-human primates, um, it worked very well in terms of keeping their cholesterol levels in check. And there's different types of cholesterol. I'm kind of being vague here intentionally, but uh, um, I think that's going to translate very well into human studies. So uh, I think the potential is really great uh, for that approach. I've seen a lot of Planet of the Apes movies in my lifetime. So we should be absolutely careful about creating super apes. That being said, we've gone longer than we wanted to go. So I want to just give you like 45 seconds here, Max, to do a bit of a, an investing takeaway. If you want to recap, there is an article that's going to be published on this uh, that's going to be free and public facing. There will also be a transcript of this uh, and Max will do a bit of an introduction. I'll do a timestamp. So you can go back and find any of the things you want. But Max, as an investor, Let's just talk a little bit about patience, about sort of how your approach has to be. It's a lot like me waiting for the cholesterol fighting super mutation, uh, that it's not going to happen tomorrow. And if someone tries to sell it to me, I should be very skeptical. Yeah, it's very important to be realistic with your timeframes and your expectations for you know, how large your company might be at a sustainable level. Um, I, my recommendation this month in August, I said was maybe my, the best opportunity for a 10X that I've ever seen and I got questions like, when do you think it's going to 10x? I'm like, that's not what I said. So I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, look, I mean, think about for gene editing and, and you know, these types of approaches, these pipelines, think on like a five to 10 year uh, timeline in terms of your investment. So I know it's very hard to do that, um, you know, when stocks go up so, so crazily high in like a six month period and they seem to go up every month, then it's probably not going to be the norm. Um, but, you know, five to 10 years. Um, I think some of these are going to be much larger than they are, and, and they might have some significant downturns in, in between there, but if you hold on for five years, I think you're going to be uh, in a pretty good spot. And be a little wary of what I'll call the, uh, the light news upturn, where a stock is up 300% because it had some very encouraging de-risking event that is not a come-to-market event. Like it is, you know, an encouraging piece of data can cause crazy stock movement. These are things you're going to be in for the long term. We've taken more of your time than we intended to. We've taken more of our time than we've intended to. So as I said, there's gonna be all sorts of supporting material on this. Thank you to Max for doing all of this research. Because once again, we talk about this a lot. Any area you're investing in 
it's really important to understand the fundamentals of that business. And so let's say I'm talking about investing in the movie business. Well, that used to be somewhat simple of a breakdown of how a movie is profitable. I wrote a piece this, this morning that's going to be live on the site probably by the time this goes up that basically says, oh, all those economics are totally different. That is kind of the table Max is setting here, that you have to understand what you're buying, what the industry looks like. And in this case, it's a lot more complicated than going, oh, wait, Black Widow might not do as well at the box office, but it's going to drive Disney plus loyalty. Uh, that is way more simple than what we have here. So we appreciate having Max uh, being able to do this, being able to lay this out, because this is an area I will say I've invested relatively heavily, maybe seven, eight percent of my portfolio is in stocks in this space. And I will not pretend I'm an expert. I am farming my research out to Max. So with that, I will thank Max Chatsko. I will thank Sam Bailey, who's going to do a lot of work to get this up. I will thank all of you for listening. We are 7investing, empowering you to invest in your future.